You're listening to Driving Law, a podcast by Kyla Lee about all things related to the rules of the road. Hello and welcome to another episode of Driving Law. I am Kyla Lee at Acumen Law and with me, yet again, my co-host, Paul Doroshenko. Hi, Kyla Lee at Acumen Law. Hi. We didn't do a podcast last week. Well, I thought that you didn't want to do it because of the holiday. Well, but you know, it was the You holiday. were also so, that was a busy week for you, so. What, what are you talking about? I finished my constitutional challenge a little early in Nova Scotia, managed to switch my flight. So I flew out like two hours after court ended. Um, And then I landed in Vancouver around what, like nine o'clock at night, I think. Yeah. Home. And I switched my ferry reservation and I got up and I took the 7 a.m. ferry uh, to the island. And then I had a uh, a full day of IRP hearings. (laughs) And yeah, it was fine. Yeah, you had a very busy week. Yeah, it was. It was a busy week and I had no sleep. And then it was the Friday. I, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but my family has a big tradition where we, do um a big easter egg hunt every Mm. good friday yeah and since my grandmother passed away um in september we haven't had an easter bunny so of course i volunteered to be the easter bunny yeah and anybody who knows me knows that when i do something i do it extra you over the top yeah so like I'd ordered candy and I thought, oh my God, I'm, I'm not going to have enough candy. I'm really worried about it. Turns out I had enough candy for three families. Um, Did you donate it to a third family? Uh, no, I put it in the freezer. So my family's getting leftover candy next year. Frozen. Freezer we, burned candy. You no, know, it's chocolate. Sealed yeah. chocolate. Yeah. Okay. Well, next year they'll complain. Their children. About ancient candy. Well, those won't, nephews, they will not won't, care. <laughs> won't stop them from complaining. Anyway. I'm sure my dad will eat it all between now and then. <laughs> A reasonable chance of that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway. Anyway, um, and you made it back and uh, you haven't reported to us about the constitutional challenge. Judgment is reserved. Well, no surprise there. <laughs> so there's my report. Judgment. <laughs> Um, No, I wanted to talk this week, though, about a different constitutional challenge where the decision on it was released actually the same day I finished my constitutional challenge. So it all um, kind of aligned. And this was uh, in Ontario involving the per se limit for cannabis impaired driving. So the, the five nanograms per milliliter of THC legal limit. And so what happened in this case, it's actually kind of a tragic case. This guy, um, uh, Brady Robertson, uh, had uh, pleaded guilty to four counts of dangerous driving causing death, um, but not guilty to four counts of impaired operation causing death, um, but like more specifically related to the legal limit and the five nanograms per milliliter, um, his blood THC concentration was 405 nanograms per milliliter. Yeah. Yeah. So that, what, 81 times the legal limit? Yeah, bad case making bad law. Yeah, he killed uh, a woman and her three daughters who were ages one to six. Yeah. Yeah. This is, you know, this is exactly, exactly that. It's a bad case to bring this challenge because first of all, he'd already admitted that his driving was objectively dangerous um, by pleading guilty to the dangerous driving causing death charge. Honestly, I don't know why that wasn't good enough for Crown, but. um, Who knows? It's Ontario. It's It's a mystery there. The really bad driving that probably doesn't bolster the position. And then you have like, if you're going to bring the challenge, if you should bring it like we did with the one that we brought in Nova Scotia, 
with someone who's a medical user who doesn't have a super high amount of THC, who doesn't display any symptoms of impairment, who doesn't have any bad driving and go look like this is ridiculous and overbroad. And instead he takes it on these facts with three dead kids, like infants, massively high THC concentration and bad driving so bad that he didn't even like argue about it at trial. And then he tries to pose the hypothetical, which is that some frequent cannabis users could have residual THC limits beyond the legal limit, even after impairing effects of the drug wear off. Yeah, yeah. Undo, yeah. Undo, you are not wrong, but you know what you are wrong about? There has never been a study to my knowledge. And I've looked at a lot of the studies and we've seen presentations from the top experts in the fields never been a situation of somebody having the 405 nanograms per milliliter reading as a result of residual THC concentration. No. And uh, certainly you can be in the um, not impaired and uh, quite a ways into the prohibited range of THC concentration. But this is such a stretch that I, I don't I don't see how you could have made the case. And, I mean, I don't understand why the Crown sought to run that case because had it gone the other way, it would have really made a mockery of the law. And uh, you know, but I think another problem with this one was that the like lawyers, I don't think put in enough expert evidence on five nanograms because the judge basically found, well, you know, some people can have five nanograms. Uh, even as a result of residual THC concentration, but it doesn't appear from reading this that there was like expert evidence that people wouldn't be impaired at five nanograms um, or that nobody would be impaired at five nanograms. And so the judge's ruling was that the five nanograms, um, it could not be assumed that five nanograms reflects a harmless amount of residual THC level, as opposed to evidence of recent consumption in every frequent cannabis user. So like, I think there was also a real evidentiary problem in that case. I think that's a fairly common thing. You and I have talked about it before, not necessarily on this podcast, uh, but with people setting up to run a constitutional challenge, uh, you know, even in your constitutional challenge, we had a long discussion about whether what that, evidence but, would we call if we were going to call evidence and you you know ultimately came to the conclusion that the crown's evidence was frail enough that it would make your case for you uh but that's uh you know that's a huge problem who's got the deep pockets for it i mean this is not uh rjr mcdonald or somebody like that who's <laughs> you know can run a a huge uh constitutional case or something some large company yeah. um you know you're talking about individuals who would have to a, understand that they need to call that evidence. B, know who to contact to get that evidence. Yeah. And C, be prepared to pay for it. Uh, yeah. And knowing what you need, you know, there, there's not a lot of lawyers who really have that understanding of what they probably need. Well, it's, it, and beyond what you need, also understand the actual science and the scientific issues and understand them to a degree that you can explain them to a judge operating on the assumption that the judge knows literally nothing about this. Yeah. And that's the thing. And I wonder sometimes when I look at older cases where lawyers were successful and I look at the evidentiary record and I can't believe on that evidentiary record, they were successful. Knowing what, you know, we have to come up with, like, you just get some judge. Yeah, that makes sense to me and, and throws the thing out. Um, you know, meanwhile, I think of, you know, we have to, we have to kill the dead horse 15 times over. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it used to be, I think, when I look at some of the older, like impaired driving decisions, like cases where people are in car crashes and the judges are like, I don't know, could be a head injury. And then yeah. like, now the trend is like, well, there's no evidence of a head injury. And there's I know, no you can have somebody who quite clearly would have had a significant head injury, airbags blown off in their face, their yeah. bruises all over them. You still, you still basically are in a situation where you probably have to have them testify about the head injury that they don't remember. Or put in some medical evidence somehow. And, yeah. and, and when you do that, um, you, you also like have to have 
yeah, like how, how do you explain a head injury when you're arrested and you're taken back to the police station and you're asked to blow? Like, oh yeah, I've got a head injury, but I never got to see a doctor because I didn't get taken to the hospital. Yeah. No, I, I, I think a lot of those cases now you wouldn't succeed and it's too bad because they were, they made the, you know, they were very logical premises behind it, but now it'd be, you know, you haven't established the evidentiary record. Yeah. Which yeah. is really too bad, but that's the that's the direction we've gone in law. That is and, now, and when it as it gets worse, eventually I'll retire, and that'll be somebody else's problem. Societies. <laughs> <laughs> There's a good way of looking at it, Paul. It's not yeah. going to be my problem. Well, so, I can't change it. So, question for you, and and yeah. it's a question I know the answer to, but I want to ask it on the podcast for the rhetorical purpose. Um, does this ruling from Ontario mean that the issue is dead? Oh, you know the answer to that one. Yes. It's a long way from dead. So there's a problem, right? And part of the problem we've got, I I was thinking about this this morning, actually, um, just trying to explain breathalyzers to people, everybody who, you know, provides a sample and they get a fail or they get at or over 80 milligrams, they always think, oh, that's it. I'm done. And you know, it's, it's pervasive in society that people assume that these things are like some sort of magic box that can read everything and, and always be correct and be telling them what their blood alcohol concentration is. Uh, just for the people who are listening, you should know that's never your blood alcohol concentration. If you blow 120, that is not your blood alcohol concentration. It's not 120 milligrams and 100 milliliters. You'd have to draw blood. You'd probably have to draw it from two or three different spots in your body. It would have to be tested uh, and there would have to be some comparison to come up with it. And it's, it's just by virtue of the fact that your blood breath ratio is not going to be correct. But mm-hmm. this sort of assumption that we have is the same now for people. We've got this magical thinking that's moved into THC. It's the same. It's all the same. Yeah. Magical <laughs> thinking that it's going to it mean something. Yeah. So, you know, the issue is not dead. Um, Somebody else could litigate it, perhaps on a better evidentiary record, perhaps with a more sympathetic accused, perhaps with some more scientific evidence, um, you know, consultation with the appropriate experts. And if you don't know who they are, they were all guests on this podcast. And if you still don't know who they are, you could call me. Um, But yeah, yeah. I don't think that the findings in this case are necessarily going to prevent somebody from litigating the issue in the future. They just need to do it properly. And that's not an insult to the lawyers because, you know, a lot of times you're working with the resources you're, you're um, given basically by your clients and by the system, if it's legal aid. But you think those 2018 changes all rely on this magical thinking. Well, this number is going to tell you something and that this number is going to be reliable and this number is going to be meaning something and that you, you know, can't question what goes on inside the box. I was on the uh, A Little More Conversation last night show on, on Chorus Radio Network talking about the anniversary of cannabis legalization. Yeah. And, um, you know, what we've seen from like impaired driving, did the sky fall like they predicted? And that, you know, that was one thing that I was asked a lot about was that, you know, that that number and what's happened as a result of that. And it really is like, I think I said this last night, I think it is just really an issue that it's a lot easier for people to understand the number because we all understand 0.08. Like we all, we're able to go 0.08, that means impaired. And also, you know, 0.08 that's probably two beers and one drink an hour, right? Like we know, we know we've been taught it. We've been socialized this information. We haven't been socialized the same with cannabis. We well, it's also been- liquid. It's also a liquid. And so you can picture your blood and it's actually alcohol in your blood. So you can picture it as a ratio in your blood. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's you. That's not how I picture it. I think it, I think it really is like a social a socialization thing. And we were never socialized about using cannabis. So we never, oh, sure we were sure we were not in the dangerous same drug indeed. Yeah, exactly. So we're not socialized to think about the science of cannabis in the same way that we think about the science of alcohol. No, just, it's a, just that it's a gateway to heroin and crack. And everything else. 
bad. Yeah. Yeah, I know that uh, after taking CBD in the middle of the day, the last three days, I'm craving the crack. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, so moving on, because this actually kind of goes into our next topic, which is about, you know, thinking about the science and socialization. I wanted to talk about Research Co's recent study, and this is Mario Canseco um, at Research Co, who did a study. Um, they do one, I think, like every year. On has, has he been on your podcast? No, but I was just thinking he would be a great yeah. guest for the podcast because he yeah, he's a lovely guy. He is. So uh, this is all on distracted driving. Um, so this is as of April nineteenth. Um, the uh, number of people who witnessed a person actually doing the distracted driving, so who saw somebody talking or texting, um, is down over last year. Well, December 2020, so over a year and a half ago. Um, So it's only 46% of British Columbians say that they have seen somebody engaged in distracted driving behavior. Uh, 50% of men um, and British Columbians aged uh, 18 to 34, 52%, more likely to say that they have crossed paths with a distracted driver than women or older people, probably because if you're older, you're driving either with your kids and they're not doing it in front of you, or you're, um, you're not doing it in front of them, uh, or alternatively, you're just more sensible because you're older. There's no more sensible because you're older. Trust me, I've seen so many. There is less, there is, there is objectively less risk taking behavior as you get older. Sure. But I've seen a lot of old people holding up their phone and talking to it. Okay. Well, on speaker. I mean, I, I see, I've seen at least two people this week. Yesterday I was driving home. There was a guy in a, and a beside me on my left in a gray Audi on West fourth. And he had his phone in some sort of flip cover and it was an iPhone and he was talking to it and, and looking at it as he's talking to it and holding it. Mm-hmm. And I think it was connected to his speaker system, but he was looking at something on his phone as he was talking to it. That was yesterday. I, it's every day. All I'd have to do is look at the intersections when I'm stopped. Well, then you So I don't see how this numbers come out at, at, at a lower number. I, I think people are just reluctant to look around. I mean, in- when I look at people, I, I'm sort of half worried that they're going to hate me. Then so. you're, in- you're in the 50% of men uh, or the 47% of people aged 35 to 54. Who well, see- people are blind. It's as bad as it's ever been. That's what I said. You know, like, I don't see any fewer like tickets for distracted driving. Like our, you know, we're getting the same number of calls every week about distracted driving as we ever were. Um, Which brings me to the next point. Um, The consequences of distracted driving. Uh, Mario's company also did a poll on the consequences of distracted driving and whether they are enough. So, a majority of people say that the fine for distracted driving, it's 56%, and that's up 4% over last survey. They say the fine's about right. 24% of British Columbians, down 6%, deem that it's too low, and 15% think that it is too high. I'm in the 15% camp. Uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's a little bit severe. I think it should be different circumstances when you're moving as opposed to when you're stopped at an intersection. Well, I think it should be a different fine and different points. Funny you should say that, Paul, because you are among more than 50% of British Columbians who are in favor of three different penalties depending on what you're doing with the phone. Okay. Uh, But that actually, the support for the different penalties based on the conduct actually fell since 2020. So Mm. even though the people who think that the fine is too high increased and the people who think that it's about right increased, um, the people who who think that the fine should be proportional to the conduct decreased. Isn't that weird? It is strange. Fines, I think, are a far more complex thing than most people understand. Yes. Um, 
and the decisions to make fines certain amounts uh, is also motivated by police officers being reluctant to issue them if it's too much. Um, the uh, if it appears to be too high relative to other ones, um, mm-hmm. and people's motivation to dispute things, you, you're more likely to want to dispute a three hundred sixty eight dollar mm-hmm. ticket than you are to dispute a hundred and twenty one dollar ticket. Yes. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's it's fascinating. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like I, I'm just wondering with inflation, what it is. Wages are going to have to start going up. And our fines are going to start seeming ridiculously low overall. Does this mean you're going to start paying me more? Well, that's the thing. Uh, you know, you're basically uh, the boss now and I've stepped aside and I let you run the firm. So that's, I suppose you'd have to give yourself a raise. <laughs> I can't. I can't give myself a raise. You're going to start looking at the bottom line and realize that we can't do it because inflation is eating our profits. We need uh, we we need um, inflation to go away for me to be able to afford to give myself a raise. So it's a it's a it's a catch twenty two. Um, inflation is hitting us in all sorts of other ways, and now all of a sudden you want a raise. I ordered dinner tonight, twenty two dollars for a burger meal from White Spot. Twenty. Right. I went yesterday. I went to. Uh, I was on my way to the Richmond office. I stopped at McDonald's for a. Uh, uh, sausage McMuffin with egg and a and a uh, small black coffee and it was just under eight dollars you should have got right now McDonald's has a four dollar promotion Big Mac quarter pounder with cheese and something else is four dollars only no oh, well that's the inflation fighter that's just a short term only though that's just to get you ready for the ten dollar Big Mac well it's trying to get you in the door because they've also got waffle fries and I bet those are like eight bucks uh, <laughs> all I know is I couldn't believe it. A sausage McMuffin with eggs should be like a buck ninety nine. Coffee should be sixty cents. McDonald's, I should three dollars. I should have my meal. I know. Whatever happened to the value menu? Um, okay, yeah. back to distracted driving. As much as I want to talk about how you get fucked at the drive through, um, distracted driving. So there's also the question of driving prohibitions because, as you know, many many times governments, lobby groups cyclists um all of these people have uh have supported or floated the idea of a driving prohibition for people who get their uh get caught distracted driving so something like an immediate roadside prohibition where immediately you're off the road for three or seven or 30 or however many days god can you imagine the tow truck operators oh my god i would open a tow yard it They'd be, be the ones driving inflation. They'd all be retired so quickly. We'd all end up having that. Well, you know what? I, I could be, I could drive a tow truck. I would just hire people to drive the tow truck and I would run the tow truck company. Okay. Well, there you go. Um, <laughs> so uh, the God, that would be ridiculous. Can you imagine it? Like the, the person who's driving to pick up their kids and gets a text message and you know, it's something significant. You look at it and you, your car's if your car's gone. Oh God, that, that would, there would be backlash. The courts would not stand for that. All of a sudden there'd be a charter, a constitutional violation. Perceiving. Somebody important would get one. Yes. Um, so support for that is actually down. Even though it's still more than half of British Columbians who think, yes, you should lose your license. Can you believe that? More than half of the people in this province who have charter rights, who have families and kids and need their cars, and probably all of them have at one point distracted drove. Oh, Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, more than- They're all guilty. More than half of people in BC still think, oh, you should just get an on-the-spot driving prohibition. How crazy. And, yeah. but it's down uh, over the previous survey and uh, about um, uh, 41% are opposed to that. And they floated with the survey participants a 12 month suspension, which they found was supported by people. So we're not talking about three, seven, 90, 30 days, 12 months. I, I don't think people and are really. I don't think it clicks in their brain. <laughs> so, oh, so, you lose like, your license if you're convicted of impaired driving. Probably, uh, probably uh, a quarter of the 
population of British Columbia would like you to lose your hand if you shoplift. So, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, you know, interesting that you say that because there is a breakdown um, based on region. So in Metro Vancouver, Southern BC and Vancouver Island, more people are in favor of the 12 month prohibition. Whereas in Northern BC and um, the Fraser Valley, fewer people are in favor of the prohibition. And think about- I just want to know about Abbotsford. Why? Because I just want to know about Abbotsford. I want to know whether or not they're they're an eye for an eye uh, jurisdiction. Well, I was they want the harshest punishment. Jurisdictions that are not well served by transit. Like if you live in Vancouver, you know, 12 months, no driver's license, unless you need your license to work. Yeah. 12 months with no license is, is easy peasy because there's a good transit system. You can get where you need to go. There's Uber. So you can, you know, you have solutions when you need cycle. It. You can cycle. I know you're, you're yeah. like the first one who's like ready to ride your bike. The moment there's some I... issue with a car, you're just ready, all prepared. Yep. Never done it, but you're ready. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> so this is this is um, B- BC's breakdown. It's actually, I think, driven by accessibility of transit, which is interesting if you think about it, because if we invest more in transit infrastructure, government might be able to get away more with coming up with stupid driving laws. Well, that's interesting. I think it's probably got more to do with uh, people seeing. Uh, so the people I see in the uh, doing this a lot of the time are in Range Rovers um, or in pickup trucks. Those seem to be the most common cell phone using vehicles that I observe. Oh, Yesterday, really? it was a guy in an expensive new Audi. So right. I think it could be partially our experience of seeing people in vehicles that are more, you know, hated. Yeah. Um, Range Rovers take up a whole lane. I wonder why somebody's driving it because it's basically hauling around the size of my living room. Um, and um, and a lot of guys in pickup trucks are contractors who just seem to drive like assholes because they persuaded themselves that they're more important than everybody else. So that could be the justification in a lot of people's minds. Okay. Well, the last thing interesting from this survey is that uh, more than half of BC uh, is in favor of doubling the current first time fine, doubling it. And almost two thirds of people support, 64% of people in BC support the idea of actually seizing your cell phone. Which is never, ever, ever, ever gonna happen. Big, massive privacy breach. Never going to happen. It's your diary. It's your business. Determine that that's your banking. Doesn't belong to a doctor and contain (laughs) medical information related to patients or a lawyer and contain privileged information that can't end up in the hands of police. Yep. Yep. Well, you're a realtor and you've got to close the deal and you're going to end up with a a uh, lawsuit for $3 million because something went awry because you didn't have your phone. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. No, not yeah, going to happen. That's uh-huh. never, ever going to happen. Also, there's not a single police officer in the province who wants to be responsible for your phone. What are you going to do? Now drive a police cruiser with a box in the trunk filled yeah. with, you know, phones in bags? Probably. <sighs> Just, find it, out and then and then find out that somebody like missed something and somebody died yeah and you know well, somebody was somebody missed a call from their their lifeline their, dying their grandmother's goodbye call yeah and oh and how are you going to determine which phone belongs to who when you seize it and you've got like 60 iphones that all look the same at the detachment Yeah, well, I'm assuming that you bag them, but then you screw one up. Um, (laughs) Or or you damage the phone. Exhibit custody. You damage the phone. Phone doesn't work when they get it back. Yep. My $1,200 iPhone. Police going to want to pay to replace that. All right. So let's move on to the ridiculous driver of the week. Ridiculous 
Tesla's driver of the week. We used to have, um, I used to make, I, I think a few times I went honk, honk. Uh, we can't do that anymore. No. No. We're still traumatized. Yeah. Still suffering. Um, so this but, you know, I, I've done something to try and heal the country, right? So this ridiculous driver of the week. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Come to us from Florida. And speaking of people needing healing, a Floridian alligator sure needs healing because a tourist, not a person from Florida, surprisingly, yeah. visiting Florida, was driving near the Everglades and ran over a seven foot long alligator who got fucking wrapped up in the undercarriage of this guy's car at 2 a.m. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And the terrified motorist didn't know what to do because he was worried this seven foot long alligator is still alive. So it's not like he's going to pull over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> alligator eat him um and ultimately uh he he does contact onstar and yeah. tells his uh tells onstar when the car <clears throat> stopped working because alligator in the undercarriage um that his car is broken down doesn't tell onstar oh yeah there's also an alligator in my car <laughs> oh my gosh so the tow truck driver shows up and he's like what the f um, he says, I drop my boom and look out the back window of the truck and notice I can't see one of the wheels of the car because the wheel of the car is literally a gator. And there's pictures of this online. Oh my gosh. It's, it's, it's kind of gross, but it's also like, it's all wrapped around the wheel impaled by the car. It's definitely dead. Um, and he couldn't even get the alligator off. He had to tow the car with the alligator still attached it's interesting uh, you know i was talking to a mechanic about animals that they've had to get out of cars and in vancouver it's not uncommon for them to have to clean out dead rats mm -hmm. um but a dead alligator hmm. yeah that's uh, an unpleasant thing that they didn't tell those people about in mechanic school yeah okay here's the carburetor and here's how it works so there's the alternator over there okay there's the alligator you, there's there's your there's your alligator there's your alligator problem there's the problem exactly it ain't got no gas in it um, <laughs> hey alligator you can't park there can't park okay well that was a good one yeah so there you go that's our podcast um, before we go, I did want to put one plug in and it's not for what you think it is. It's actually for our wonderful colleague, Dana Lynn McKenzie. Yes. And this is a plug worth plugging. Yes. So as everybody knows, or probably many people don't know or care about every year, Canadian lawyer magazine does a top 25 most influential lawyers in Canada poll. And one of the finalists this year is our very own Dana Lynn. Yeah, and she's lovely, and she's uh, back at UBC and uh, and making changes there. So yeah. she's, um, uh, she's an impressive lawyer. Yeah, yeah, she's very skilled, very talented, and she's doing amazing things for Indigenous students at UBC. Um, she was on the cover of like Trek magazine at UBC um, and she works for us part-time and every day I wish she worked for us full-time, but I mean, she's, she's doing so much more good for the world that I, I can't <laughs> hold it against her. <laughs> We're pretty lucky to have her um, yeah. and uh, very glad that she moved back to British Columbia. So she started working for us remotely when she was still on the East coast and then came back to BC and uh, yeah, that's uh, lucky, lucky for British Columbia to have her back. And, and also like lots of opportunity for her here. So that's great. And you can vote for Dana Lynn by going to Canadian Lawyer Magazine's Top 25 Most Influential Survey. Uh, cast your vote for Dana Lynn. Also cast a vote for Chad Haggerty in the um, uh, Criminal Human Rights and Advocacy section. Chad, of course, previous podcast guest. And lovely guy. Okay, thanks, Kyla. All right. If you need to reach us, you can find us online at VancouverCriminalLaw.com or give us a call at 604-685-8889 and tune in next week for another exciting episode of Driving Law. Yeah.